Well, good morning, everyone. You know, with that spiritual and poverty, I was kind of excited when you said that. You know, I was pretty close to being spiritual then. (laughs) Well, we will. We're starting the new series on the Joseph story. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, as we come before you today, we pray for your Holy Spirit to truly cover us with your Spirit and to fill us and to use us because, Father, as we come before you, we are in desperate need of you. Thank you that you care for us, you love us, and have set us free. And uh, as things at times may look good, how can they become so bad, Lord? I pray, Lord, that we will, in the midst of anything that happens, we will always hold on to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like, you can use the bulletin insert to follow along with the notes, and we encourage you to do that. Well, Chuck Swindoll, you may have heard of him, a famous Baptist pastor, has uh, uh, served the Lord in many ways, also E. Free, I believe. He stated that when he was on vacation, he read the book called Adrift by Steve Callahan, and it's the story of Callahan who built a vessel that was to sell him through the whole Atlantic uh, see, and sort of a large loop. He hit bad weather and his vessel went down. And this was uh, back in 82, 1982. Well, Callahan's boat was destroyed mid ocean and he was able to exist on a raft for 80 days before he was rescued. And the thing that kept the man alive, he said, was hope. His lowest days were the days when he could see when he could see no hope and he could not see the possibility of being rescued or making it to the islands or coming into the shipping lanes and being found by one of those vessels on its way to the trade routes. His hope kept him alive. Someone has said we can live 40 days without food, eight days without water, four minutes without air, but only a few seconds without hope. A woman tells a story of a particular night while driving during her third year as a speaker giving seminars all over the world, excuse me, all over the country, she was driving into Wheeling, West Virginia to teach a class or a seminar to 150 women. Her background included raised by a mother and grandmother who took great pains to teach her that families take care of one another, and she knew she could always count on her family, and her family could always count on her. Well, she was driving faster than she probably should have, and She desperately wanted to make it before a storm began to move in, and she wanted to get there as quickly as possible. As she saw the sign telling her that Wheeling, West Virginia, was eight miles away, she sped up even a bit more, even though there was a a few raindrops began to fall. And as she's driving along, she heard a loud boom, and that's never a good sign, right, when you hear that driving along. And she knew that uh, something was wrong, so she turned down the radio, and she could tell that she had a tire problem, her tire blew. So she slowed down. She remembered in high school, you're not supposed to slam on the brakes, right? Pump it. So she pumps those brakes and she slows down. Well, on the side of the road, she looked around, saw nothing but the hills around her. A six-lane highway traveling fast. And she locked the door to be safe and tried to figure out what her next move was going to be. She didn't have a cell phone because they weren't uh, well-known at the time or quite that, that common. And, every, and she kept replaying all those bad stories, you know, about this single woman on the side of the road. And she just kept thinking about all those bad things and scary thoughts came through her mind. And she was wondering, what should she do? Should she walk to the next exit? It was beginning to rain. It was getting dark. And she was truly afraid. Well, at that very moment, a large semi passed by and she could hear it shuddering her car, felt it shuddering her car. And as she's driving by, she noticed that the semi is pulling over. And a man gets out and runs over. And she again thought, am I safer or am I in more danger? And so here comes this, uh, as, he's, as this guy's walking out, she takes a pad of paper and she writes down the license plate number and the, and the company this man works for. And then she put that information under her seat, just to be safe. Well, it was raining quite hard. The driver is soaking wet, comes to her window, and she opens only three inches, you know. And he says, I saw your tire, it's, it's blown, I can change it for you, but you've got to open the trunk because I have your keys. And so she gives him the keys, knowing that she's lost all leverage then. 
And so he goes back there, he takes out the tire, he takes out the, the jack, and he changes the tire, puts it all away, and gives her back the keys. And, she says, and she's very thankful, she's very happy. She says, like, how can I thank you? How can I pay you back? He said, we drivers in Ohio believe in taking care of women in trouble on the highway. Well, she then asked to, uh, for the name of his boss so she could send him, send him or her a letter re- uh, relaying the wonderful thing that he had done. And he kind of laughed and he said, okay, here's the, he gave him a card with the name of the boss and, and, and on the card. And also the trucking, trucking company. Well, she thanked him again and now this soaking man went running back to his truck and off he went. And there she went on to her seminar and presented the seminar. Well, she went back to Florida, her hometown. Okay. And she says, I'm going to write a letter. Made a t-shirt for this guy. And said, thank you. It says a highway hero on the t-shirt. And she sent the card. And it was very happy. And then the card and t-shirt came back. Address the unknown. Hmm. Odd. Well, she called the number on the card and got a recording saying no number existed. She called the city newspaper for that town, asked for the editor, explained the dilemma, asked that the letter be, to the editor be placed in the paper, thanking the driver. The editor of the paper, who had lived there all his life, said there is no such company in that city. He further investigated and called her back and said there is no such business registered in Ohio. The ed- editor went one step further. He called the State Motor Vehicle Bureau to ask about the license, because she had written down the license plate number, and told that there was no such place plate had ever been issued the upshot is that this man this truck and this company never existed the rescue never happened that she must have been dreaming and she says but i know i wasn't in our day and age we must look to god more than ever we must seek him and cry out to him daily We must hunger for his word, surround our lives with his truth. We must be sold out to him. We must be devoted to him because our Lord reigns and he is supreme. The God of the universe, the God we worship, he is all powerful, ever present and everlasting. There is no such thing in all creation that can subvert or thwart God. What he says he will do. His word is solid. His word is true. He is our rock and he is our Lord. We give glory to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So I encourage you today, look to God. I encourage you, look to God. In the midst of, the, of living in this evil age, look to God. In the midst of random and deliberate acts of chaos, look to God. He is our hope. He is our truth. When things are difficult, look to God. When things are wonderful, look to God. That is what Joseph in the Joseph story, the Joseph narrative, has to learn to do, is look to God. Joseph in the book of Genesis will have to learn to look to God when things are good, when things are bad. He will have to endure the struggle, endure the shame. He will have to learn to live with power. He'll have to learn to look to God. So let's go to Genesis 37. This is the Joseph narrative. Joseph was the 11th of 12 sons of Jacob. His mother was Rachel, who died after giving birth to Benjamin, his younger brother. He had di- she had died on the way uh, in the area near Bethlehem. The 12 sons will become the 12 tribes of Israel, if you will. Their names will. Now, Jacob, when he fled his brother Esau... He went to Rebekah's country, and he went to Rebekah's country, that's his mother. He worked for his uncle Laban for 21 years, and in that time he married uh, two women, Leah and Rachel. And he loved Rachel more than Leah, but God opened Leah's womb, and Rachel's womb was closed. Well, because Rachel could not give birth to uh, children, she said, well, here, have my servant Bilhah, and you can bear children through her. Well, Leah saw that happening, so she said, well, take my servant Zilpah and may have children through her. So you have four women who give birth to 12 sons. And here's the breakdown of the sons of Jacob according to their mothers. You have Leah, who gives birth to six boys and one daughter. You have Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and then the daughter Dinah. And then Rachel gives birth to Joseph and Benjamin. Those are the last two born. And then you have Dan and Naphtali born to Bilhah. And then Zilpah gives birth to Gad and Asher. And those are the 12 
sons. So the first thing we want to look at here in this chapter is God's way will succeed in his timing. In his timing. Let's look at the first 11 verses of Genesis 37. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Or a kind word to him, yeah. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of this dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told it to his, when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So in this passage, we get a glimpse of who Joseph is. His mother, Rachel, has died, but he's the favored son of his father, which makes him cocky and arrogant. He's 17 and he's arrogant. And since he's the favored son, he's despised by all his half brothers. He's despised. Jacob's favored Joseph, but he had a habit of favoring and he's he's used to favoring. I mean, wasn't Jacob favored by Rebecca? And wasn't Isaac, did Isaac favor Esau? And didn't Jacob favor Rachel over Leah? And wasn't, didn't Abraham favor Isaac over Ishmael? And so there's a history of favoritism. And he was also on the wrong side of favoritism, Jacob was. He had worked with Laban for 21 years. He had his wages changed 10 times. His Laban looked at him negatively. So he felt the other side. Of favoritism. And as there was favoritism in the family, there would be rivalries. Well, of course there would be. Since Jacob favored Rachel over Leah, Leah and Rachel would quarrel. And of course, the sons would quarrel with each other. <laughs> so as Jacob favored Joseph, the brothers would quarrel with him. There was conflict in the home. There was tension. There was angst. Favoritism in the home creates a hostile environment. And they had a hostile environment. Well, you know what happens if you show a hint of favoritism to another child in the home. Here's before you don't show that comic strip yet, but there's a comic strip with baby blues. It's about these kids uh, and the parents growing these kids up. And this is one of my favorites. There's a father trying to show there's no favoritism. Okay, now show that comic strip. It says, there, two identical peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, each with the crust removed, placed on identical plates. Thanks to my careful preparation, there's nothing in this snack for you to fight about. And then they look at each other. And then she says, he made mine first. <laughs> no fair. Doing everything you can. No favoritism. Let's make a couple observations, a few observations. Number one, Joseph becomes a target. Miles, would you hand me that water, would you? I forgot to bring my water up here. Joseph becomes a target. He becomes a target because of the favoritism shown to him. Now, Joseph's name, what does Joseph's name mean? It means to add. It means to add. And the reason why is Rachel named Joseph saying this, May the Lord add to me another son. So it means to add. Now, in Genesis 37, there's a play on words. Okay? There's a play on words. Uh, in verse 3, we see that Jacob's love was added on to Joseph. Okay? And because of the favoritism. And in verse 8, it says that his brother's hatred was adding up. So Joseph's, Jacob's love was adding up for Joseph, and, J, and the brother's 
hatred was adding up. Okay, so there's a play on words there. Now, to make matters worse, and to show the entire world that his father loves his son more than any other son, he gives him a special coat. Now, in the NIV, it says richly ornamented coat. In the King James, it says a coat of many colors. In the ESV, it says a robe of many colors. In the NLT, it reads a beautiful robe. Now, the struggle is, is when the Hebrew scholars came upon these two words, there's two words here, they go, well, what does it mean? I don't know what it means. We'll just say coat of many colors. How about that? So that's how that came about. But it's hard to tell what it is. It's hard to, and it's difficult to translate. Now, the best way to describe this coat if we can describe it, is this coat was an expensive coat. It was a warm coat. It was a comfortable coat. It was a great coat for the climate and for shepherding. It was a coat that had a hood and probably the sleeves went all the way down. And here it was like, if you were sheep herding, this was the best coat to have. And I'm sure the brothers, when they saw this coat said, I'd love to have that coat. That'd be the perfect coat to have shepherding. Of course, they were doing all the work and Joseph was probably hardly doing any of it. So when Joseph gets this coat, of course, he shows it off. Look at me. Look what I got. You know? uh, do you have a coat? <laughs> I have a coat. And, of course, his brothers are enraged. In fact, remember it said they could not speak a kind word to him. You, too, would probably be angry if this happened to you. It's outrageous that Jacob would so uh, obviously sh- display his overly affection to Joseph, basically saying that Rachel's kids are the true kids, and the others are just pretenders. That's what it looks like. I tell you, look to God. Secondly, Joseph shames his brothers. So Joseph is a cocky, arrogant 17-year-old. You know how teenagers can be, right? You know, know, when I was 17 years old, I knew more than anybody in the world. Okay, I was the... I was the, I knew everything, okay? In fact, when, between 17 and 25, my parents learned, a lot, learned an awful lot. <laughs> well, actually, I learned an awful lot. <laughs> so, so Joseph goes to the place where his brothers are tending the sheep, and you know what he sees? Something's not right. Hmm. We don't know what it is. But he goes to his father and says, Dad, these sons of yours. Well, we don't know how he said it. And he reports them, gives them a bad report. Joseph thinks that he's the supervisor, the foreman, and he can do no wrong. And the text is not clear again as to what they were doing wrong, but he gives a bad report to his father about the boys, about the other sons. And now Joseph looks even better to his father and worse to the brothers. Number three, God reveals to Joseph the future. So Joseph has these two dreams, and they're rather obvious in their meaning. Now remember that his dad, Jacob, had a dream when he saw the latter going from heaven to earth. God is giving a glimpse to Joseph of what of the future, of what is to come. And what is to come is that Joseph will be in a position to where his brothers and even his parents will bow down to him. Now you can imagine when Joseph woke up and went into the family area where they were all gathering, and he says, hey, guess what? I had a dream. And maybe he was sarcastic about it. You know, guess what happened to me? I had a dream. And I bet he kind of laughed and he gave that grin. And his brothers were getting more angry. Their fists were clenching tighter and their hatred was deepening. And remember, they can't say anything good about Joseph. And it's getting worse. And it looks like even God is favoring his bro- Joseph over his brothers. It's getting worse. The tension is getting thick. His two dreams Now, remember, are similar. The first one is the sheaves of wheat. They stand up. His stands up and all the others bow down. And then, of course, he has the 11 stars and the uh, 11 stars, sun and moon, bow down to him. Two dreams similar. Again, this is setting us up for when Pharaoh has two similar dreams as well. Well, as a result of these dreams, the hatred is increasing. Verses 5 and 8. The hatred is adding up, if you will. Something is about to happen. The tension is getting thick. But for Joseph, there is no tension. Life couldn't be better. Everything is going well. He's living well. He knew he was going to rule one day. He was 17. He was great. His father loved him. It even looked like God loved him more. And he felt good. Well, I I know as you read this story, you know that Joseph's dreams do tell us that he's going to rule one day. 
But we also know that Joseph was not ready to rule yet. He was too cocky. He would have been a tyrant. He would not have been a leader. God had to prepare him. He had to humble him. He had to have him rely on him. God had to show him that he was to look to God, not to his circumstances, not to all the things that were happening to him, but to God, not to himself. So God gave Joseph a vision of what was to come. But he did not give him a vision of the road that he would have to travel. He gave him a vision of what was to come, but he didn't show him the the road he had to travel. And one thing we must remember is that we too have been given a glimpse. Our glimpse is heaven. Our hope is Christ. Yet the road we travel can be and will be tough. All we have is Christ to hold on to. We cannot rely on our circumstances, our talent, our education. We cannot think that just because our circumstances are okay, God is in control. Our, our circumstances do not dictate the character or nature of God. Our God is God regardless of what we go through And I say to him, look to God in times of plenty and in times of need. Because our God is sovereign. Look to God. Secondly, God's way will produce a struggle. Let's take a look at verses 12 through 24. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to them, So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they're grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here. The man answered, I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. They saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into the, the cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him, and from then from them and take him back to his father so joseph so when joseph came to his brothers they stripped him of his robe the richly ornamented robe he was wearing and they looked took him and threw him into the cistern now the cistern was empty there was no water in it so things get worse well four guys decided to go mountain climbing one weekend in the middle and in the middle of the climb one of the fellows fell and he fell about 60 feet and landed with a thud. And they looked over and says, are you okay? What, is, there, is there anything we can do? He says, I'm alive, but I think I broke both arms. We'll toss, me a ro- well, we'll toss your rope down and, and you, we'll pull you up. Just lie still. And so he said, fine, way down below. And so they threw the rope down and they start pulling him up. And three-fourths of the way up, they go, didn't he just say he broke both arms? He says, How are you pulling yourself up if you broke both arms? And he said, where's my teeth? (laughs) When we say that God's way will produce a struggle, we recognize that the path that he has called us to life, that he has called us to travel is a life of faithfulness. God has called us to live a life of faithfulness. And along the way, we will be tempted to stray from his holy and precious word and relationship. But there's something else going on. He takes us down a path of suffering to rely on him, to remind us of our humanity, to show us that he is provider. If you look at the nation of Israel, for example... They were in slavery for over 400 years. And when God broke through and saved them and set them free, he said, remember, you were slaves once. You treat those who are less and struggling with compassion and love. Remember who you were. In the midst of your suffering, remember who you were. Because I cared for you as I care for them. He wanted, God wanted to show his compassion through his people. And you show compassion when you walked that struggling road. God has compassion for the weak and in our prideful spirit. We will not pursue compassion, 
but oppression until God reminds us of who we are in him and what he did to save us from the tyranny that we have faced. So I challenge you, look to God. So number one, look to God even when it's tough. You know, in Romans 5, we read, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in sufferings because we know that sufferings produce perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character hope. In James 1, it reads, Consider it pure joy. You know, I've always struggled with that. Consider it pure joy. Maybe you could just say, endure. (laughs) No, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. So look to God even when it's tough. To follow Christ is to walk the path of suffering. Now, there's a a theologian named Jürgen Moltmann in his book, The Crucified God, said this about the professors in 1945 in Germany, primarily in Europe in general, uh, after the war had ravaged Europe. They said this, Shattered and broken, the survivors of my generation were then returning from camps and hospitals to lecture room, a theology which did not speak of God in the sight of the one who was abandoned and crucified, would have had nothing to say to us then. God has suffered through Christ. Christ who died, who rose from the dead, knows suffering. He knows what it means to suffer. In the midst of suffering, there's hope. There are, and our hope is certain because Christ rose from the dead. You know, as the story continues, Joseph is sent by his father to go and re- give a report of his brothers. And let me tell you, he doesn't have a good track record when it comes to giving reports, Right? He's going to give a report. Now, this is a suicide mission in many ways because going alone, he is inviting and telling Joseph, this is your ruin, basically, because he's sending him out all alone. (coughs) He finds out that the brothers were in Shechem. Now, if you read the story of Genesis 34, you realize that Shechem is not a great place to go for, the, for Israel's sons because they had killed all the men in Shechem. <laughs> and so they're not in Shechem, so he goes and finds them in, in Dothan. Well, now remember, Joseph reviews himself as the supervisor. He's the, the boss and the overall good guy in his mind. He is naive to think that wherever his brothers are, he is safe. Because with all the jealousy, all the anger, all the tension, and all the rage going on in their brothers' in the brothers' hearts, the last place Joseph wants to be is with his brothers. Because there is a, mount, a great amount of hate going on. So he goes, and he goes because his father sent him, unaware of the danger. And when the brothers saw him, they plot against him. Number two, know that God is sovereign. Know that God is sovereign. You know, it's interesting how the story of Joseph is similar to, uh, in some ways, to the Christ story. In John 1.11, we read this. He came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. Joseph went to his brothers, and they did not receive him. Now, of course, he brought a lot of that on himself, though, right? Although Jesus knew what waited him, that his presence on earth was not welcome, Joseph was not welcome, even though he was not aware of it. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was betrayed for 20, 30 pieces of silver. The brothers plotted to kill Jesus and the religious leaders. The Pharisees plotted to kill Jesus, uh, Joseph or the other one, Jesus, this one. Interestingly, in John 7, we read this about Jesus. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. In Mark 3, we read this about Jesus. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he's out of his mind. So he has his own, Jesus' his own family struggles with Jesus. And, and, and the brothers in Joseph's family struggle with Joseph. The family of Jesus and the family of Joseph struggle. There was tension in jo- Jacob's family because of Jacob's favoritism. It was a recipe for disaster, and that is what transpired. They took a hold of Joseph. They tore his precious coat off. They threw him into a cistern, which is basically a hole that fills up with water when it rains. And the brothers waited. The brothers wanted to kill him, but God is sovereign. Now, God had a plan. He could and would use the jealousy of the brothers to accomplish his plan. Joseph has no idea how this will play out. In fact, it looks like all the hopes and dreams that Joseph had are gone. 
But God has still, God still has one more move. Now, Reuben wants to rescue Joseph. There's a reason. There's a reason why Reuben wants to rescue Joseph. If you read 3522 in Genesis, you'll find out that Reuben slept with Bilhah, Jacob's concubine or other wife. Now, again, this is part of the tension and the rivalry going on because Bilhah belongs to Rachel and Reuben is Leah's son. So again, you're seeing the tension and the problems going on. And Reuben thinks that if I could just rescue Joseph and take him back to my dad, my dad will love me again. But you see that he is cursed if you read Genesis 49, verses 3 and 4, that Reuben never gets the blessing of his dad. I tell you, you have to look to God. You know, so God is going to use the suffering to create a new man in Joseph where he would learn God is sovereign. Number three, God's way brings hope. Let's take a look at verses 25 through 36. God's way brings hope. Start with verse 25. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we... What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hand on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, dipped the, blo- the robe in the blood. And they took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. When Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, in mourning will I go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. You know, a bar of steel worth $5 when, when made into ordinary horseshoes is then worth $10. If the same bar is manufactured into needles the value rises to $350. And yet if, the, if, if it's made into delicate springs for expensive watches, it's worth more than $250,000. The same bar still is made more valuable by being cut to its proper size, passed through one blast furnace after another, again and again, hammered and manipulated, beaten and pounded, finished and polished until it's ready for those delicate tasks. God's furnace makes us valuable beyond all the riches of the world, far greater than what we could ever produce. So I I, I challenge you, let the white hot heat of God's holiness enrich your life today. Look to God. Joseph was going to the furnace of God, if you will. So the slag of idolatry and arrogance could be removed. In the midst of our struggles in life, we must believe that God is in control, even when we can't always see it. In Hebrews 2.8, the writer says, God left nothing that is not subject to him, yet at present we do not see everything subject to him. <laughs> it's a great quote. God's in control. Sometimes I can't see it. <laughs> but God's in control. The reality of what is true does not always feel true, yet it is true. God is sovereign, and even during trials, God is in control. So look to him. Number one, there is a glimmer of hope left. There is a glimmer of hope left. The brothers threw Joseph in the cistern, and while there, I imagine he began to shout and scream and say, Dad's not going to be very happy. Dad's going to punish you. You'll never be get lift this down. Can't we just shut the lid? And he just kept screaming and yelling. So the brothers know they can never take Joseph out. They can never take Joseph out. They either have to kill him or something else. And Judah comes out with the something else. Judah comes out with the something else. The attempt to remove Joseph by his brother gives us a glimpse 
of hope. By not killing him and by putting him in the cistern, hope still exists. When Judas is down with some of his brothers uh, eating their evening meal, he sees a caravan coming and he says, Hey, why not sell him? We'll get rid of him and make money at the same time. We won't ever have to deal with him again. That way we won't have to kill him after all. And what we're seeing when Joseph is sold, there is hope. He may not feel like it, but there's hope. Hope is still alive because Joseph remains alive in his soul. The promise of God that he revealed in the dreams is not and will not be thwarted. God's way is hope. There's always hope in God. There's always one more move in God. If you were the brothers, you had the perfect out. You had the coat. All they had to do was smear some blood on it, and they were on their way. Joseph would be forever out of their, their, way, their lives. His cockiness was gone. His silly dreams were banished. Life was now fair, and it was now good for the brothers, except when they came home, and they had to show their father the coat. Life didn't seem so good when their father became so disheartened. If in 37, 36, we read those words, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar. Joseph is sold as a slave. All of his life is over in his eyes. His future is gone. A sense of desperation came over him. A deep sense of sadness overwhelmed him. Maybe there were some of you who may be experiencing something like this, where you may have been enjoying life, and then the struggles came. Bad marriage, financial crisis, child issues, or hurt words from the past. I tell you, look to God. When things look good, how do they become so bad? Because we live in an evil age. It is random and deliberate. We at times bring disaster upon ourselves, and other times we're victims of random acts of evil. But through it all, know that God is sovereign, and look to God. On a hot summer day in Denver, the wind was not blowing, and the temperature rose, and the day wore on, and the mother... Uh, carrying or walking with her daughter. We're walking out of a car shop toward the street, across the street. She was holding her daughter by the hand, and she was really engrossed in this card, reading it. Not sure what it said. But as she's walking by, there's these two men that could that were watching her and noticed that as she was reading this card, she's walking closer and closer to the street, and here comes this bus coming at a good clip. And she's walking along, and all of a sudden, as these two guys are about to yell, hey! When all of a sudden a wind came up and knocked the card out of her hand. And she looked over, caught the card, the bus goes by, and she kept walking. Unaware of what had happened, I tell you, look to God. Let us pray. Father God, as we come before you today, we thank you that you've set us free. We thank you that in the, in the midst of life's struggles, in the li- midst of life's victories, I pray that you're there with us, that you love us, that you care for us.